Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the seminar today. Uh, my name is Xiaoyu Wang. Uh, I'm with uh, Professor uh, Bahir Abdelhai from Civil Department and uh, also under the supervision of uh, Scott Center from Department of Industrial Engineering. And today we're, we're going to talk, share some insights we gained from the uh, a set of methodology called eMartins, which was developed for uh, a specific topic under the umbrella of intelligent transportation systems. We call it adaptive traffic signal control and coordination. And my personally, my research spans over uh, methodolo methodological research in pure reinforcement learning to the application in uh, transportation systems. So this talk would be an interdisciplinary talk uh, between reinforcement learning, artificial intelligence, and uh, uh, transportation. We're going to share some insights in how to combine the AI tools into the application field, for example, in TSC. So before we start, uh, I'm going to cover some basic uh, terminologies in this field. Transportation, uh, sorry, traffic signal control. Uh, we, in, transport, in traffic signal control, we want to optimize the signal plan, or we call the signal timing plan, uh, to optimize the traffic flow in a transportation network. For example, downtown Toronto, or any surface road network in the city. Uh, it has been developed for more than half a century. In the very beginning stage, it's called fixed time control. Uh, at the old time, for example, 1950s, we have we can manually count the historical flow from each approach of, inter uh, of an intersection, and the traffic engineers can design uh, signal timing plans, and we just alternate uh, different time uh, different time plans according to the traffic flow profile we observed from the field. Later on, we have something called actuated control. So beyond the fixed timing plan, now we have more sensors in the field. What we call the inductive load detectors. It's installed under the pavement. It gives you a signal once a vehicle is holding above the uh, loop. So now we know if there, is a, if there are vehicles uh, from a specific uh, lanes. So we can extend certain phases, for example, light turn phases, if there are enough amount of vehicles, or we can not extend them when uh, there's no vehicle. So we get more flexibility in control. And later, in uh, late 1960s or early 1970s, we have the cycle level adaptive control. Now we have more data. We have the real time flow reading, for example, from weekday uh, peak, 6 a.m. to uh, 7 p.m. Sorry, 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. We know that uh, the traffic flow from northbound of a specific intersection is high, so we can do the real time uh, optimization. Uh, we can we can calculate the cycle speed, calculate the offset of a specific corridor in the, for example, downtown area. We call that cycle level adaptive control. It means the cycle plan, uh, sorry, the timing plan is reactive to your real time traffic scenario, real time traffic profile. So over the development, the historical development of uh, TSC technologies, we see that. As long as we have more data, we have more powerful computation, we can gain fi finer control over the intersections. So this is the situation we have today, or about the future. Talking about today is more complex, <coughs> but we can always imagine what could happen in the future. Uh, it's more relaxed topic, so we go through the future first. Talking about the future, we can't avoid the topic of, era, uh, of uh, the era of artificial intelligence. For example, the success we have all 
seen uh, in the domain of NLP, uh, which is called the foundation model in general domain of uh, machine learning. And uh, to be honest, this term is quite of outdated. I prepared this slide a few days earlier, but uh, just prior to today, yesterday, OpenAI just announced their pioneering video generative model. It's called uh, Zora, uh, which claim to evolve the world, the dynamic of the world in their latent space, and they can generate a video up to, a, up to one minute uh, from just a few lines of uh, textual content. So from all this success, uh, somebody would claim that with enough data and computational power, we can solve anything we want. So in the near future, we call it the, the future of ATSC instance A. Uh, imagine that we have access to the detailed technical data of each individual vehicles in the road network, and we have enough computational power, we can optimize whatever we want. Yeah, yeah. In, the, in the short future, we might be able to access to detailed data, and uh, we can gain finer control, we can coordinate the signal uh, in a, at a second level over the whole network. Or, Or more aggressively, if we get uh, full automated and connected vehicles, if the vehicles can coordinate with their neighbors, in the long future, we might not need traffic lights anymore. So that means that closest our today's talk, uh, the world does not need us. Is that the truth? So yes and no. Well, reality is cruel. Uh, at least in the near future, we don't. We have. We still have a lot of uh, constraints in this domain. We can't fully utilize the uh, technologies we presented. Uh, well, what we had in the NLP field. We're gonna talk about the uh, constraints later. But uh, that is the good news for us. We still. There's still a value for our research. So back to today. What kind of challenges are we facing? Why can't we apply the uh, boost SOTA models in a uh, generic uh, AI field? We have these few types of constraints. For example, the data accessibility. Currently, what we have mo most in field is called the loop detector. It's a fixed point detection. It does not provide you the full sense of the traffic on the road. So maybe we can deploy enough cameras or radar or lighter which can give you a longer range of view of the road. No long, no, uh, not only a fixed point detector as the loop detectors, but from there we have limited detection range. Uh, occlusions may happen and uh, they only gives you what the reading of uh, vehicle positions. We might imagine the internet of vehicle, if it comes true, we can uh, access to the detailed uh, vehicle dynamics. We know the exact position, we know the speed or even acceleration rate of each vehicles, but at least now, or maybe a few, few years later, we, uh, the LV technology is still uh, facing the challenge of penetration rate and uh, privacy concerns. So in terms of computational power, we're not open AI. So we can't deploy thousands of GPUs in the field. And uh, also there's a fun story. Back two, six years ago, open AI started from doing reinforcement learning in robotics. But nowadays, open AI is famous to the world 
by its LLP models. Why is that happening? Because OpenAI made, made the decision to abandon their previous, well, uh, it might be, it might not be a, a firm statement because we, we don't know what is uh, the real research under the wing, but uh, they at least shift their focus to NLP from robotics because this field, this field of, of NLP has, uh, you can access to more data, you have accessibility to the whole inter internet where you can gain uh, hundreds of billions of data of corpus, but uh, currently we don't have those accessibility in traffic. What's more, the budget and infrastructure, we can't expect the city to deploy servers to the roadside units, and also uh, the budget constraint is expecting us to design fully distributed or fully decentralized solutions. So with all these constraints, what is the vision of our research? As we mentioned, we want to combine uh, advanced AI technologies, but we're facing all these constraints. So uh, in this research, we're gonna provide the vision to investigate what would be the best way to incorporate AI technologies into this constraint field. So why should we choose reinforcement learning? Some they would argue that it's model free. It's a, it's a good sign, so we should always go for it. So the question after this statement is that is model free really free from models? Is model free the core reason we should choose in our, in our research. So if you go to a random reinforcement learning course, uh, you might have this first lecture telling you that in reinforcement learning, specifically in model free methods, uh, agents will interact with an environment and it just learns how it should perform automatically without the need of a calibrated model it's appealing, it's fun, fantastic. But in the second lecture in this RL course, they may start talking about Markov decision processes. And uh, talking about optimization, what are the expected returns, and introduce you classic approaches, uh, as listed there. So the answer is no. Even model-free reinforcement learning is not free from models. It's just saying that the agent is agnostic to the models. If we compare the reinforcement learning model-free RL approaches with the classic approaches, this is the difference. Within the box is the reinforcement learning pipeline. But if we want to use, utilize the same data in a classic approach, we would first calibrate the model, then design a planner with whatever methods you have, maybe the methods I presented in the last slides. Then finally, we get the same kind of evaluation pipelines. That suggests the agent is just bypassing some steps we had in, in a classical approach. We do not need to explore a calibrated, data, uh, sorry, a calibrated model with a planner. We just learn a good policy, a good strategy from the interaction, from the experience. What is the benefit of doing that? It basically eliminates the, what we call compounded error. Is that good, is that bad? Uh, we don't know yet, but by defining such an agent, uh, we've already joined the model space. It means reinforcement learning is not free from model. You still need to carefully design your agent to better capture 
the rule, the, the model that would represent the world. So if you close your mind, close, sorry, close your eyes and uh, hit your mind, okay, uh, let's design an agent like this. Maybe it's not matching the real world, so it does not have the enough capability to represent the real world. Uh, well, an agent design like that may not be able to give you the ideal performance. That's the So this is why, this is where model-free reinforcement learning could, uh, could benefit us. Because in model-based approaches, uh, you need to explore the model. If you calibrate your model, and the calibrated model has bias, has bias, it has errors, when you plan in it, you're exploring in the bias. So that's what we call a compounded errors. So this statement is always true. Uh, the truth model of the world is always better than a good model, and it's always better than the bad model when you do the planning. But uh, model three reinforcement learning gives you gives us another alternative because it bypasses the modeling error, the compounded error. It fits in the middle of the good model and the bad model. For example, in the when we want to collaborate a uh, handful intersections we might not be able to calibrate a good enough model, so we would prefer to go with no model, which is where model free uh, RL would, would shine. So back to our vision, we want to address all these constraints and uh, deploy the model free RL approaches. And now we know that uh, when your model, when your task is really complex, and you don't have the capability to get a, to calibrate a, a good enough model, maybe a model three approach is better. So now we know that we should go with this approach. What should we do? We still have those constraints, uh, unsolved questions. And we've already talked about that understanding the world, understanding the model of the world is extremely important. How can we leverage our domain knowledge as a traffic engineer to guide the agent design in order to at least uh, address the constraints highlighted above? So the, the system we're going to design is to collaborate agents, what we call uh, traffic signal coordination. So let's start from an intuitive example. So now two agents want to collaborate to move the television from spot A to spot C. We want to ask the blue agent to assist the red agent. And uh, imagine that the red agent is about to move in this direction. What should the blue agent do? It should know that the red agent is about to move to a specific direction to assist it, right? It can't move to the opposite direction. If it moves in the opposite way, the TV just fall. So the blue needs to know not only the state of its own, it also needs to know the state of the red, and where's the TV, where's the goal, and uh, also what's the red policy. Back to the traffic domain, this is another example uh, if we focus on an individual intersection, we might have this circumstance. This is the current time step. If we do one action, project this uh, traffic into the future, we, uh, we assign green light to west eastbound, then we allow the single vehicle pass through. If we rather take another action, we will allow the northbound vehicle, uh, sorry, the northbound platoon pass through, which gives us gives us the higher reward. Certainly, the action too, right? But uh, doing MDP or doing RL is not about optimizing current status. It's more about optimizing your future. What would happen in the future? What if there's a, a, a beyond the vehicle we have currently seen in the eastbound? There's another platoon of five waiting to come into the current intersection. Can we still take action too? Maybe not. 
action one is better. So that is what the coordination means in traffic signal in traffic signal control. Mathematically, mathematically speaking, uh, this is a graphical representation of the MDP model. State is what you what you see uh, in the current intersection, and the action labeled by the uh, 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 rectangle will affect the state. The current state with the action be jointly defines your next state. And within this example, what else? We have a unknown traffic demand coming from the outside of this intersection, which also affects your next state. This is, so in the previous example, this, this state S could be the blue agent, and this circle, the question mark, would be your red agent. So the blue agent want to know what's happening in the red agent side, red agent side. And in traffic, this circle, the question mark, is, is more than a single agent, right? Because for this intersection, it has four neighbors. And beyond these first half neighbors, you might have a large signal grid so this incoming demand is determined by the, well, generally speaking, is determined by the whole world. If we position our question into a 10 by 10 signalized network, and each agent now want to know the joint state and policy of the rest 99 intersections, that is intractable. This is where we actually need the insights from the modeling. We're, the question we're facing is that we're operating the intersections in the second level control. We want to determine in the next second or, well, next few seconds, what is the traffic light? What is the phase of the traffic light? So from this prior knowledge, we know that vehicles can't jump from intersection one to intersection three in one second. So we can explore this structural information in the underlying dynamics to simplify the collaborative architecture. So the first principle we would apply is called the principle of factorization. Uh, let's say we have traffic states corresponding to each of the uh, vehicles. What defines the dynamics of a vehicle? First, the position. Second, the first derivative of position which is the speed. Third, the second derivative, which is the acceleration rate, right? But, uh, uh, yeah, so if we associate those vehicles close to an intersection as a state factor, we associate all these components to a single circle, we can factor factorize the grid MDP into some smaller ones. Well, it might be intuitive, might not be, but what benefit us is that prior to this factorization, we're facing a great joint distribution. Your whole world is evolving from state T to state T plus one, and you might have hundreds or thousands of random variables, but now with factorization, you can write the dynamics in a more concrete way which enable us to further simplify it. So now we introduce another assumption called dominance, dominance relaxation. As we said before, we're controlling sections in a second level. So we can expect that a vehicle cannot be teleported to uh, kilometers away in one second. So with this relaxation assumption, we can say that, okay, the traffic status associated with intersection one will not directly affect the traffic status in intersection three. By doing that, we can remove the two red connections and mathematically it represents us this feature. So with the factorization and relaxation, what we can do is that we use more 
smaller joint distributions to represent previously a uh, grid distribution. When we remove random variables from this, well, it looks terrible, but when we remove one variable from this long equation, what we're doing, we're reducing the complexity because this function is complex, it raises you know, expo exponentially. So the last step, we're gonna break the reward signal down to factors also associated with uh, each of the intersection. So in this case, we only uh, ignore two connections, which seems useless, but, but think about a network of 100 intersections where we would omit thousands of connections, which greatly simplifies uh, your potential approach. So from this slide to the next slide, well, again, what I'm going to do is I will transpose the right-hand side graphical model 90 degrees. Don't be nervous. This is exactly the same, we just transpose it uh, by 90 degree. It represents the dynamics from time t to t plus one, where each of the factor, set of factors are associated with, in, with an intersection. And we introduce two more set of connections, mapping the state to whatever your agent can observe. Currently, all these arrows are identical mappings. It means your agent is access, accessible to the true states. So we, we design a set of agents, each associated with an intersection, and they directly observe the state of an, of an intersection and apply controls to this intersection. Furthermore, think about the uh, collaborative example where agents move the uh, television. Agents want to collaborate with his direct neighbors to know their state, state action, or more importantly, their policies. And from this, uh, so, sorry, uh, what the dominance relaxation assumption gives us is that this agent does not need to know its second hop neighbors because because of this mathematical representation state sorry. state one is only determined by these variables. That's the reason why we can simplify the communication and collaboration scheme down to one hop. And that gives us the design insight of our first methodology called eMartin, where each agent is composed by two modules. The first module, the encoder, Compass is the raw observation into an embedding, and each of the each encoder of an agent will broadcast its encoding or its embedding to its direct neighbors. And the executor of an agent will aggregate those embeddings and generate the, first, uh, the, the final uh, decision. At inferencing time, this is the uh, feeding forward scheme. Why do we need uh, such an encoder? It's because that we don't want to pass the raw observations such as images or videos to your neighbors. That's really complex, the communication scheme. So with an embedding, we're feeding fixed length vectors to your neighbors that saves the communi communi communication bandwidth. And uh, intuitively, we can just use a feed forward network to do this compression. At the backward training uh, time, the arrow signal will only update the local encoder. You can see this is the traditional Bellman error we get from reinforcement learning, and this error signal only updates the executor and the encoder of the local agent. Why do we, do we, why do we need that? Keep in mind, we're designing 
a light enough structure, a framework, so we don't want to share the gradient signals, for example, across agents. So this gradient signal will be stopped right here and be passed only locally. By doing that, there's another beneficial because we train the local encoder in an end-to-end -end way. We are hoping that this encoder will provide you information more than the observation. It will encompass some kind of policies from agent A. So this is again what we need for agent collaboration. Recap the vision we have. Uh, we want to cooperate the AI technologies in the uh, ATSC field uh, while well addressing these types of constraints. What we did in the first methodology or e-martin is that we leverage our domain knowledge to guide the agent setup while addressing the computational constraints and the communication constraints. But we still ignore the first constraints, the data accessibility. We were assuming that what we have in the road are always accessible. But that's not always true. State is not always equal to observations. This is a classical configuration of the traffic network where you have cameras covering a certain detection range. And in this specific case, we have different types of sensor limitations. For example, we have limited areas. We don't know what's happening in this gap because the camera just can't cover those areas. And within the detection area, we have a, a limited access to high order dynamical properties, for example, the speed or the acceleration rate. What would that happen if we don't handle this gap between state and observation properly? For example, now we have a platoon coming from west and a single vehicle coming from the south. At first time step, B is idling, and the intersection A would ideally allow the eastbound platoon to pass by. Seven seconds later, the vehicle is hidden from the detection, both from A and B. And intersection B only observes the northbound vehicle. So now intersection B have to make a decision, should I allow the northbound vehicle pass by? To be acknowledged, once the phase is changed, it will be blacked off for a short period because it has to pass by the uh, yellow time, the red time, and the minimum green time. But currently, agent B sees the, sees the only northbound vehicle, and in his mind, it, it's thinking, okay, allowing it to pass through is the best uh, strategy I would uh, take. So it shifts the signal, holding the eastbound vehicles, the eastbound platoons from passing through, which induces a higher delay. That is the difference between state and observations. We don't always know, we don't always know what's happening within the state, and these mappings, these identical mappings are not accessible in the real world. So we can modify the model a little bit to represent this change. So that introduced a property called partially observable, where those identical mappings will be, will be replaced by these observation functions where the agent only access to limited information rather than those states. So how can we address this kind of issue? We can start from a intuitive understanding. Is there a hint we can of the existence of this platoon. From the current time step or the, this, this screenshot, we have no idea if there's a platoon of vehicle 
existing between the section A and B or not, right? But if we think about the history, this platinum of vehicle was released by the section A. So if we go back to the history of A, we know that, okay, this platoon was presented maybe 10 seconds ago, and because it was in the through movement lane, so they can only go to this part of your road network. In such a way, we know that for each of the agent, we need to know the history of your neighbor states. So, although we still have set of agents that's associated with interrupting the sections, now for the communication scheme, we need more than the directly accessible observations. What we need is the history of observation, which will compensate the lack of information we get from the uh, direct observation. That leads our design to the second uh, methodology, or what we call Imarin Plus. Uh, briefly speaking, history matters. Uh, mathematically, it's about how we addressing the partial observability issue, but intuitively, just think about the last example, we need to know the history, which is the vehicle releasing profile of your neighbor. How do we uh, address that? We replace the encoder of the old Martin structure from feed forward neural networks to any components you could have. Uh, it could be RN, it could be long short term memory uh, networks. Whatever you have, it can capture the long term sequential information. It would benefit you from understanding the history of your neighbors. So, quick question. We say the history of observations, what, how long the history should we think about? Should we think about the, a day before, an hour before? Because although we have LSTM, which is expected to track long enough history, but uh, during training, it, there's always a capacity to capture the history. So empirically, we, in our design, we use 20 seconds because we're expecting to be aware of those hidden platforms from this time period. So this is an example from the previous uh, illustrative showcase. With limited sensings, if we design, we, if we use agents like independent PQN or the naive e Martin, what we'll, we'll, we will have is exactly what we saw before. Agent B will allow the northbound vehicle Pass through, for, uh, pass through first, which induce higher delay from the eastbound platoon. But with Imarin Plus, now the intersection B knows that, okay, there's a vehicle, there's a platoon coming from uh, intersection A, because I know the history, so I can get optimum policy in my mind. In the real world case, Deadlines approaching. So, in the real world case, we see from pre time to independent agents to basic collaborations to collaborative agents which addresses partial observability issues. We keep gain improvements over the total delay over uh, a corridor of the traffic network. And even from EMR to EMR to EMR plus, we gain 70% of improvements of the traffic uh, of the travel time saving. To conclude this today's talk, first we over, we, we oversee the potential benefits we can gain from all the free reinforcement learning when we have a complex model. This is where model free methods could shine. Secondly, we want to leverage the domain knowledge to design our agents. This is where this is how we uh, conclude the e Martin, which is a distributive collaboration algorithm. And lastly, if we take the data constraint into consideration, we need to address the partial observability issue 
and that's the insight we gain from the emerging class. So it's pretty dense, but uh, thank you for bear with me. Uh, that's all for today. Um, any questions?